Hey, did you know that at one time, the fourth largest publisher of comic books in the United States was a small imprint from DC Comics? It was Vertigo Comics. And today we're going to be talking about the rise and fall of Vertigo Comics. The history of Vertigo Comics really starts with three people. It starts with an editor named Karen Berger, uh, a writer named Alan Moore. Maybe you've heard of him. I have. Okay. We did a whole episode mm -hmm. on him. Check it out. Yeah. And an anthropomorphic plant monster named Swamp Thing. Not Man Thing? Not Man oh, Thing. Oh, okay. Swamp Thing. Swamp Thing. Who actually, they, you know, they both came at the same time. I know. Yeah. And there's supposedly no, like, there's no connection between no, them. Like, none. No yeah. one was copying off nope. anyone else. It's very strange. But yeah. Very so, strange. Yeah. Back to uh, Vertigo. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, so let's talk about Karen Berger. In my opinion, Karen Berger is one of the most important people in the comic book industry because of what she managed to do with Vertigo and DC and how she influenced the comic book industry. She's still alive? Yeah, she is. Yeah. Actually, she runs an, uh, another imprint now at Dark Horse called Burger Books. Oh, we should try to get an interview with her. Well, maybe. We'll see. Oh, <laughs> just for you, because it's not like someone you would like. Maybe, yeah. Right. Uh, in 2013, she was dubbed the mother of the weird by New York Times. Uh, she worked as an editor at DC for 30 years. Uh, born and raised in New York City, she graduated Brooklyn College in 1979 with a degree in art, lit um, sorry, English literature and art history. And right after graduation, went to work at DC as an assistant for Paul Levitz. Within six months of being hired as uh, Levitz's assistant, she was editing House of Mystery, which was an old horror anthology yep. left over from the 50s. Yep. And she realized that she liked working with the weird fantasy and horror stuff way more than she liked superheroes. She did do some work on Wonder Woman, and I think that's what, like, she okay. was like, nah, 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 and kind of, like, liked the weirder stuff. In uh, 1983, she took over editorship of Swamp Thing from Len Wein, who was the original editor of Volume 2. Swamp Thing was languishing. Sales were bad. Uh, reviews were bad. Fans weren't a uh, big, you know, weren't really yeah. that into it. Uh, and at the time, or just before that, one year before that, Len Wein had hired Alan Moore to take over as the writer. And he was, at this point, basically unknown. He was just some English guy who wrote for Warrior in 2000 AD. And Karen Berger kind of gave him carte blanche. To so do that, that's his first thing to do? That in, was his in, first American, in American written book. Movies. Yeah, okay. it was Swamp Thing. And uh, Karen Berger gave him carte blanche to basically do whatever he wanted with the character. And he basically, from the ground up, reinvented the entire mythos of Swamp Thing. And he was allowed to do that. Yes, because the character's failing, so they kind of just let him do whatever, do whatever he wanted. wanted. Right, and it actually turned the book around. Uh, people became a lot more well, interested it in it. It was very different. Yeah, he wrote with a lot more sophistication and aiming at an older audience. And Karen Berger realized uh, that she liked that, too, the aiming at a higher level right. of sophistication in story. Now, this... this uh, Alan Moore writing mm -hmm. Swamp Thing is pre Vertigo, right? Pre Vertigo, he's writing yes. it for DC Comics now. Yeah, I mean this this was all happening about ten years before right. Vertigo even started. That's what I thought. Right. So, um, she gives Alan Moore this permission to revamp the character, and it it works. It kind of brings the character back. And again, like I said, they're aiming at a more sophisticated right. kind of storytelling, uh, something that's a little darker, more a little stranger. They're going a more English, much more English. Route. Yeah, not for kids, but mm -hmm. for adults. Right. In 1984, Swamp Thing number 29 uh, gets turned down by the um, Comics Code Authority. <gasps> right. I will not publish it because there's some really dark stuff going on in issue 29. If you're familiar with, with uh, Swamp Thing, it's the issue where Abigail uh, realizes that her husband, Matt, is actually possessed by the spirit of her uncle, Anton, who is basically been raping her. Ooh, yeah, okay. it's pretty rough. It's so rough it, stuff. It, it, what's interesting about that is this, this is 1983. 83. No, 84. I'm sorry, this is 84. And they're still appealing to the comic code. They had to submit, yeah. Weird. That, yeah. That, that late. Yeah. So that, It lasted that long. Yeah. So what happens is uh, Karen Berger asks permission from the higher-ups at DC to put the book out without approval uh, because she's believed in the story so much. And they did. And what's the, what's the... At that point in time... What's the penalty for not having that on? You just don't get the... Well, advertisers might pull out. So there's a uh, risk at advertisers. But again, the book was sort of a cult 
hit. Yeah, because you in, know? in the early 1980s, you start to see a rise of comic book specialty stores. Right. And comic book specialty stores didn't care about mm -hmm. the comic code because they're selling a lot of independent right. comics. Independent comics don't have the comics yeah. code on them. So the fact that you're doing this, this spikes your sales because it doesn't have the comic exactly. code. Exactly. And this is actually what I was saying to you before. Uh, this is actually sort of a secret collectible. Right. Uh, Swamp Thing number 29 should be a lot more valuable than it is, but you can get it pretty cheaply on the collector's market in right. mint condition. We'll have to look for uh, it. And again, like for, for the first issue of Swamp Thing to be released without the comic code approval, it's kind of a big deal. Yeah, that is definitely a big deal. And basically, uh, Karen Berger just decides not to submit any more Swamp Things for approval. And this gives Alan Moore even further crea creative freedom. And he starts to tell some unbelievably amazing stories in Swamp Thing. Um, the one I clearly remember, I was 12 years old and I bought this issue. I was away on vacation with my parents. Right. Went into a general store in a little town called Corinth, New York, where my grandparents were living at the time. I bought, I think, I want to say it's issue 35. I might be wrong on the number. It's part two of what's called the Nuke Face Papers. Okay. It's the one where Swamp Thing dies. He actually decays because he comes in contact with a radioactive character. And then he figures out that he can rebirth himself from any other plant anywhere around. Oh. Since it's just his conscience... Or his consciousness. So he doesn't die. That he doesn't die. His consciousness moves to another plant and then regrows him. His connection with the right. green. It was such a weird, dark, strange comic. It had a huge effect on me. And you loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I remember, still remember above the title, it had a, a, not a subtitle, but above the title, it just said sophisticated suspense for mature readers. I'm surprised your parents let you get it. Yeah, How old were you? 12. I'm surprised. It was 85. I'm surprised yeah. that you were allowed to read it. Yeah, it was great. Great, great, great. This is a big success. In 1986, Karen Berger basically becomes DC's British liaison. And this is where she really starts to make her mark on comics as an industry. She brings over from England Neil Gaiman, Jamie Delano, Peter Milligan, and Grant Morrison. And puts them to work on other DC mature audience titles. There was not yet the Vertigo imprint, right. but they started uh, basically a small line called the Mature Audience imprint. That It wasn't really an imprint. Uh, it was other DC comics. And it just had on the cover mature Suggested readers. for mature readers. That was it. And from this, we get Sandman, Hellblazer, uh, Shade the Changing Man. Oh, so they're all DC comics before Vertigo? Yeah. I was going to they were Vertigo. We, we get Grant Morrison writing Doom Patrol. Okay. And Animal Man. Animal Man was so interesting. So That's cool. What I, bought right? I read that a lot when I was right. younger. And these are huge successes. Big, big, big successes. Because, again, nobody in America had seen anything like right. this before. England, they knew about this right. kind of writing for comics. America had not seen this. And so 1992, the mature titles were so successful that Jeanette Kahn and managing editor Dick Giordano gave Berger permission to start her own imprint. And this is where Vertigo was born. In 1993, Vertigo launches officially. The Vertigo line kicks off with six pre-existing titles that had already been running, but now they get rebranded Vertigo. We have the Sandman, Shade the Changing Man, Hellblazer, the character John Constantine starts in Swamp Thing, then jumps over to his own title, Animal Man, Doom Patrol, which Grant Morrison had left by now, is being written by Rachel Pollock, Swamp Thing, uh, of course, being the book that started it all. Does it stay numerically? The, the numbers, numbers stay. stay. Yeah, the numbers stay. It just stay. changes from they DC keep, in the corner to right, Vertigo. Right, they keep the legacy uh, numbering and okay. they go on. Right. The original series that start with Vertigo in 1993 include... Death, The High Cost of Living, which is a spin-off from The Sandman, focusing on Death. Morpheus's sister, Death. Great book, by the way. Uh, it's a mini series. Yeah, I know you're a fan of all of these. Yeah. There was the uh, limited series Enigma, uh, which ran for eight issues. And then there was Sandman Mystery Theater, where they brought back Wesley Dodds, the original Sandman from the 1930s. Oh. And uh, did a, a noir title. But more 90s. adult. More adult-oriented, but it took place in the 30s. And it was a mystery tale. Interesting. Featuring the original Sandman from the... Um, the Justice uh, Society. The Justice Society, yeah. yes. Really good book. It was written by uh, Matt Wagner. Okay. He's a good writer. Um, the real cool thing about Vertigo is that it didn't just kick off a bunch of ongoing series. They did a mix of one-shots and limited series and ongoing. So it was really... Um, you knew the, the, it made the stories more unpredictable because they could end at any time. Right. And uh, unlike the mainstream DC titles, uh, if a character died, they were dead. They, they didn't come back. Right. They, that was it. It was it was more permanent. Stakes were higher. 
And again, the storytelling was a lot more sophisticated and, and it dealt with some it's serious appealing ideas. Appealing to college students, basically. Much more college students, yeah, yeah yes, easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, her two keys to success, I think, for Karen Berger, is creative freedom for the artists and writers. She did not restrict people very much. Um, the one big restriction that Vertigo did had came from mainstream DC, where they basically were told to kind of keep the mainstream DC characters out of the Vertigo oh. titles because they didn't want a kid to see like Batman was in this and then go buy that book and be like, oh my God, this is so much like not for see, him. But that's interesting because yeah. Animal Man at the time is also part of the Justice League mm -hmm. of America. Yes. But the Vertigo series was kept, tried to keep very separate from. But that. That, see, that changed because he was in. Mm -hmm. He's a big part of that series yeah. at this point. I'm not sure how long Animal Ran ran under Vertigo. I don't remember what happened okay. there. Um, because he's really he's the only at this point. Him and Swamp Thing are the ones who are. They are main. They do DC show up. Characters. They interact with the DC universe a lot yeah, more. They yes, do. They do. Right. But again, they tried to, I think they tried to distance them. Uh, once in their, going, in their titles. Okay. Once Vertigo got going, yeah. Well, now they're all. Now it's, well, that's. Or all part of That's it. one thing, yeah. Uh, so the other, th like I said, Creative Freedom was one of the secrets to her success. And the other was trade paperbacks. She really pushed the idea of collecting. More adult. The stories in trade paperbacks and getting them in bookstores. Yeah, it's more adult. To aim at the audience who would be in bookstores. Right. And maybe not comic stores. Right. Uh, maybe not great for the comic industry, but it definitely... No, I don't think it is. It definitely sold Vertigo books. Um, she won the Eisner Award for Best Editing in 1992, 1994, and 1995. Interesting. Yeah, so she was... You know, her praises were very much so. Uh, in 1996, the initial series that kicked off were starting to end. Uh, many writers were leaving for other pursuits right. and other things, and uh, new series were launched. And... The new series that launched, some of them were really, really great and just as good as the original. Some of them you know, didn't really grab the same kind mm. of audience. So you had The Dreaming, uh, which was an extension of The Sandman, right. uh, but done by other creators. Uh, and you had The Sandman Presents. Again, uh, it was like an anthology series, but with other creators dealing with The Dreaming and, and Morpheus and The Endless and all that. You had The Invisibles by Grant Morrison, which was a great series, but definitely not everybody's cup of tea. Okay. It was about a, a an here. anarchist terrorist cell fighting demons who are trying to keep control of the world. Okay. Very weird. A lot of drugs, a lot of weird time travel stuff. Bizarre. All right. You had Preacher from Garth Ennis and Steve Dillon, which, in my opinion one of the best comic book series that ever ran uh an incredible western religious becomes a tv show thing it was a tv show a very interesting tv show yep you get we uh from helix which was another dc imprint that fell apart we got transmetropolitan came over to vertigo okay which is a story about a journalist in the far future named spider jerusalem uh he's kind of like a hunter thompson kind of character who takes on the world of the future it's really bizarre okay a lot of fun uh hundred bullets uh, which I still can't believe has not been made into a TV show yet. Especially because a lot of these were made into TV shows. 100 Recently. Bullets. The, do you know the concept for 100 Bullets? Nothing about it. A stranger comes up to you in the street, right. hands you a briefcase that has a handgun in it and 100 bullets that are untraceable and guarantees that however you use that gun, you will never be caught. So you can kill whoever you want and not right. get caught. And that's what the story kicks off with. Just do an episode on who our hundred bullets are being used really on. Really good. Hundred really bullets is good. a lot. Yeah, I don't uh, know, I, maybe ten. I mean. Another Sandman spinoff, Lucifer, starts also a TV show. Became a TV show both at uh, ABC. That most people and Netflix? no Fox. Fox. <laughs> most people don't realize that Lucifer. That's Lucifer is Sandman. based on yeah. a comic book. Yeah. Uh, another favorite of mine, Why the Last Man, another show by Brian Vaughn, became a show. Yep. Cool. DMZ. Was a limited series that started. I've seen it before. It's a, also a TV show. Yeah. And Fables, which I haven't got a chance to read yet, but everyone tells me it's amazing. Okay. Uh, so those were like the sort of the mid middle period of, of Vertigo, and they were successful, not some as them, successful. Some of them were more successful as TV shows. Yeah, not as successful as the original run of Vertigo. Uh, in July of 2006, Berger was promoted to senior vice president and executive editor of Vertigo. She got a big bump up. Interesting. Yeah. Paul Levitz, who was then president, where he, remember she started as yep. assistant, and he worked his way up to president of DC, uh, basically said, uh, Berger built Vertigo into an input, which is simultaneously one of the comics leading creative and commercial success. He was a big fan. Big fan. Yeah. As the mid-90s uh, comics wound down, Vertigo kind of faltered a bit. 
uh, they started to get a lot of competition for people who were kind of taking that yeah, model. Everybody was doing that. And doing that again with other stuff. Dark yeah. Horse. You get something uh, successful, everyone tries to copy you. Dark Horse. Image started to put yeah. out a lot more mature uh, reader stuff. We get a lot more independent comics selling well. Independent. And there were market changes also. Yeah. Absolutely. The, the comic book market becomes more adult oriented. Right. Yep. In 2012, Hellblazer gets canceled because of low sales. Uh, and Karen Berger left DC. Uh, left Vertigo After 30 years. In 2013. Right. Wow. Uh, she was replaced by her longtime assistant, Shelley Bond. Now, Shelley Bond had been working there since 93. She came in at the beginning of Vertigo. So she's at 20 years. Right. Something is waking up. The Sandman Overture. The first new Sandman story in 17 years. Written by New York Times number one best-selling author, Neil Gaiman. Illustrated by J.H. Williams III. Available in print and digitally. Now, here's where we get to what I think of as the corporate shenanigans phase of this history. <laughs> in 2016, DC restructured Vertigo and basically just eliminated Shelley Bond's position. Basically like, okay, you don't really work here anymore, right? Okay. Uh, editor Jamie Rich took over, uh, uh, oversight of Vertigo, not editor, but he had uh, creative oversight. Okay. Until May of 2017, when Mark Doyle became the new editor of Vertigo. So Shelley Bond was eliminated, they had one of this guy look over it, and then they gave this another guy the head of Vertigo. Okay. In 2018, they attempted a line-wide uh, rebranding and relaunch uh, now calling it DC Vertigo, right. not just Vertigo. Uh, I think what happened was they became successful and the people at DC were like, why isn't our name on this? Right. right? We wanted to go out into our other titles, which are more adult oriented right. also. Exactly. So there were lots of complications with this relaunch. Uh, two of the titles, one called Border Town, which dealt with immigration. Right. Uh, the creators were getting death threats, uh, Ooh. because of it. And then one of the creators was brought up on assault charges. And they just basically canceled the title. Okay. Uh, and then the other one was called Second Coming, which was about uh, the return of Jesus, which you can imagine they ran into a lot of problems very well. with uh, Christian groups. That ended up going to another company and being published I'm there. I'm surprised Preacher didn't get in more trouble. I can't believe Preacher didn't get... I Some of the stuff that they do in Preacher is... The, uh, the Messiah in Preacher uh, is oof. one of the most offensive oh, things. Oh, my God. Uh, I but, am not a religious person. Yeah. In any sense of the word, but mm -hmm. watching the show, when they show the Messiah, it, <gasps> the it reveal, offended me. The reveal in the comic is one it of the most is amazing. so offensive. The, the, it, that scene where they first show him has one of the funniest lines I've ever heard in a comic. I'm not going to repeat it here because I don't know if our audiences would be okay no, with it. I wouldn't repeat it here. <laughs> <laughs> it, I, I don't even want to go into the discussion if you mm -hmm. haven't seen. Yeah, oh my look God. it up if you're interested in what we're talking about. We really don't want to talk about it here because it's it, again, it's mm -hmm. I'm not religious, but it was it was offensive. Right. So then after this, uh, the line kind of floundered and fell, and then it was discontinued in 2020, and right. DC folded a lot of the previous Vertigo characters into their mainstream yeah, line. It still shocks me that Constantine is part of the regular it doesn't DC make, line. If you read Hellblazer, it makes no sense that he, he is hanging he out is with a, superheroes. He's a big part of... He pops up in everything. I mean, he's a great character. Great he's character. a great character. But his what happened in Hellblazer... It, God, I can't even... He, he is, he's, <laughs> what, he's, he's in something I've been reading now. He pops up in something a lot. He's such a son of a bitch. Like, Maybe, I can't believe he's... It uh, might be Shazam. He might be really. Yeah, he's that popping makes, up wow. in something like really weird. Like he's a big part of mm -hmm. th this new, this the new line that they're doing yeah. now, the Dawn of DC. Yeah, he has some involvement because magic is all thrown off. Yeah, so he has a big part in the. And it's it's just he pops up in yeah. some issues. And I'm like, that's really weird that he's he in this there. issue. <laughs> yeah, like they could have done another character similar to him and yeah. not made it him. It's right. just, I, I, I whatever. I guess yeah. okay. Uh, basically, Vertigo is replaced by Black Label, yeah. uh, which is the 17 plus audiences. But so far from what I've seen, it doesn't have the kind of creative it's oomph. Suicide that Squad, has. Peacemaker has a new Black Label out. It's um, it's more adult. It's it's most adult superhero right adults, but it doesn't have the. No, it's not unique. There's no uniqueness to it. It's not as unique as Vertigo. No, there's was, no right. there's no unique characters being introduced. With, it's the superheroes in a more adult theme. Right, with one exception, which I read one called "The Nice House on the Lake." 
Okay. This is a black label title. It's pretty cool. It's an, it's a horror story set at a vacation house. It's very okay. cool. Very, very cool. I was cool reading the, the Suicide Squad one and now the Peacemaker one. Peacemaker one is... The late, Peacemaker one's called like Peacemaker Tries Hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's... No? It's Peacemaker. If, yeah. It's... it's the it's, TV show. It's the TV show. Right. That's exactly what... And it, it looks... It actually yeah. looks like John Cena. Right. So why are we talking about Vertigo? Uh, other than the fact that I was a fan. Well, that's the only reason. It's pretty significant to the history of comics. Uh, first off, it was one of the first times that a big comic book company offered an alternative to mainstream comics. Uh, you got a title or a line rather with no superheroes and, uh, or, or if they were superheroes, they were weird. Yeah. <laughs> superheroes. Sure yeah. Uh, and they were odd sort of things and they were surprising. You never knew what you were going to get. They were unpredictable, right. which is the best part of it. Uh, it opened up new worlds to comics. Uh, Vertigo is one of those events that kind of made serious intellectuals yeah. look at comics and say, hey, this is a, a good storytelling medium. They got nominated for awards. A lot of awards. Regular yeah. comic books had never and been nominated for. they're taught in yeah. um, you know, college courses and yeah. stuff like that. Right. They're not it, for kids anymore. Right. And it ups the game for a lot of other creators in independent comics, well, especially. It changes the whole industry. Yes, that's what I was about to say. The next one was, it changes, it changes. the entire comics landscape. Uh, it and it sounds like door. she's fully responsible for it. She was very responsible for it, yeah. Uh, and it opens the door to um, a whole new way of approaching comics, right. you know? And uh, I think it was a good thing. Many people don't really think it was a good thing. I think it was a good thing because you can have these split levels. Like, DC is now basically divided into three levels. You've got Black Label, which is 17+, plus, yeah. Mainstream DC, which is 13+, plus, and then they have a Younger Readers, which I can't remember. Is it called DC Kids? It might just yeah, be called it DC might Kids, be DC Kids. Which I, is for I Younger don't read Readers. I any of those, so... Uh, so you, you do have a place to look for more sophisticated stories, and I don't think you would have that if not for what Karen Berger did at Vertigo. Well, you want as many people as possible buying comic books. Of course, yeah. doesn't matter what right. age they are. You want everyone invested mm -hmm. in the comic yeah. books that you're selling. Right. And if you want the... If, if you love the medium, you want it to grow. You want it to change. And you, you grow to with different it. Things. Exactly. Right. So what do you think? Did you like Vertigo? Did you have a favorite Vertigo title? Um, my favorite Animal pure... Man. My favorite pure Vertigo title, meaning it wasn't, it didn't exist before Vertigo, was Preacher. Uh, but uh, my favorite that ever came out of Vertigo was actually Hellblazer. Um, Mine was know, Animal Man. Yeah, Animal Man was good. And Sandman is... I don't read any of the other ones. Sandman Animal is, Man's the only one I read. You should read Sandman sometime, because what he did was... One of the cool things that he did was he mined some very obscure DC Golden Age characters. And used them. And used them in different ways. It was very cool. So what do you think? Let us know how you felt about Vertigo... Did you learn something during this video that you didn't know? Is there something else we should have been talking about? Did we miss something? Leave us comments. Like, subscribe. Karen Berger. Get, we'd love to yeah, get in touch you. with us, Karen. Hit us up. <laughs> Collectors Confessions at gmail.com. Thanks. And until then, love what you collect. Collect what you love. We'll see you next time. Bye.